All right, so thanks to those who joined us. Uh, my name is Amanda Hargath from AgriAbility of Wisconsin. I'm the Outreach Specialist. Um, we're excited today to be talking about farm stress with Lori. So she'll be presenting about the emotional toll of farm stress and the strategies that can be used to help create um, resilience to that stress. And we will have some time for questions and discussion at the end of the presentation. Um, I will ask that all of you are muted um, now, but you can always ask questions in the chat box as well um, as we're going along. And with that, I will turn it over to Lori. Good morning and thank you for joining me this afternoon. My name is Lori Zerl. I'm a human development and relationship educator for UW-Madison Division of Extension. And um, I've been um, with Extension for uh, 26 years now. So um, today I'm going to share my screen here to get my presentation going. And as Amanda said, we'll be having um, some time at the end for discussion. But if you um, can't remember your questions, you want to put them into the chat box, you could do that as well. So let me get started. I introduce myself and we're going to really start with just talking about what stress is and how does it affect us. Um, stress can be defined as the degree to which you feel overwhelmed or unable to cope as a result of an unmanageable pressure. Simply put, it's our body's response to pressure from a situation or a uh, real life event. As you can see on the slide, I've listed a number of kinds of stress, time stress, sleep stress, people stress, uh, money stress. Lately, uh, it's a lot about world stress as well, all the things that are going on around us with the pandemic and, and um, you know, the, uh, just the politics and everything that are going on can be just plain exhausting. And as you all know, farming is one of the most demanding occupations in the United States. Some of uh, the stressors that you face every day are financial pressures, debt load, unpredictable weather, volatile markets, extreme outdoor work conditions, excessive workloads, could be some inter intergenerational differences if you're working with um, different generations on your farm. Health, pain, or mobility issues connected to work-related injuries, disability, or just years of hard physical labor. Too often, health um, and valuable relationships suffer as a result of these everyday chronic stressors. Short-lived feelings of stress are a regular part of daily living, right? We go through small stressors every day, but when these feelings become chronic or long-lasting, they can severely impact um, our personal health. Over long periods, chronic stress can contribute to the development of a range of physical and mental disorders. The effects of life stress can accumulate over the lifespan and um, often exceed those of tobacco use or um, excessive alcohol consumption and physical inactivity. Ranked as one of the most stressful jobs in the United States, farming contributes to some of the highest rates of mortality in farmers from stress-related illnesses, including heart disease, hypertension, ulcers, and nervous disorders. And as you can see by the slide, some of the writing isn't very good. Um, it shows a number of the other major um, health risks associated with chronic long-term stress. Physical burdens of farming can result from working long and strenuous hours. And if stressors aren't addressed, they can lead to physical illness, mental health issues, substance use, and maybe even suicide. Behavioral and emotional changes can also be symptoms of farm stress. Well, that introduction seemed a bit gloomy. Why don't we all just take a moment right now to take a deep breath. So take a deep breath in through your nose, 
and out your mouth. One more time. So the good news is, and he, as human beings, we are generally very resilient creatures. So what's resilience? Psychologists define resilience as a process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress, such as family relationship problems, serious health problems, or workplace and financial stressors. In a nutshell, Resilience can be defined as the ability and our tendency to bounce back. It's a quality that allows some people to be knocked down by life and come back even stronger. Over time, people generally adapt well to life-changing situations and stressful circumstances, in part thanks to this resilience. So think of a time in your own life where you had a major life change. Maybe it was um, getting married or having a child even though those feel like um, joyful times of your life, they're major stressors. And we end up adapting fairly well to those changes. Resilience involves behaviors, thoughts, and actions that anyone can learn and develop. So it's not just this innate thing you were born with. You can learn to become more resilient. Like building a muscle, increasing your resilience takes time and intentionality. If you don't pay attention and work at it, um, it's not quite, you can't be quite as successful at it. So let's take a minute to explore how our overall wellness contributes to our resiliency. I love this slide from SAMHSA. Um, they um, divide our dimensions of wellness into eight different dimensions. And you can see there's emotional, financial, social, spiritual, occupational, physical, intellectual, and environmental. So in contrast to poor health, wellness is the state of living a healthy lifestyle. It's an ongoing process and a lifelong journey, not a one-time event. Wellness is often categorized into these interconnected dimensions. It's a holistic integration of physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. Attention should be given to all of these dimensions as neglect of any one over time can adversely affect the others and ultimately one's health and well being and quality of life. They do not, however, have to be equally balanced. We should aim and strive for a personal harmony that feels most authentic to us. For example, if you are, um, you know, you happen to be someone who's um, retired, you probably aren't going to be as concerned about your occupational um, health. But um, you do need to balance all those um, uh, dimensions that are important to you. We automatically and naturally have our own priorities, approaches, and aspirations, including our own views on what it means to live life to its fullest. So for the purpose of our discussion today, we're going to only focus on one of these dimensions, and we're going to focus on the emotional dimension of wellness because as you can all maybe relate to, there are some emotional tolls to the chronic stress that you face um, daily as a, a farmer or someone that's um, working with someone who does farm. So emotional wellness is the ability to successfully handle life stressors and adapt to change and difficult times. Sounds pretty simple. Emotional health is an important part of overall health. People who are emotionally healthy are in control of their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And this is a key I'm going to say again. People who are emotionally healthy are in control of their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. They're able to cope with life's challenges. They can keep problems in perspective and bounce back from setbacks. They feel good about themselves and generally have good relationships. Being emotionally healthy doesn't mean you're happy all the time. This is really a misconception. It's not about happiness. It means that you're aware of your emotions and you can deal with them, whether they're positive or negative. Emotionally healthy people still feel stress, anger, and sadness. We all do. 
but they know how to manage their negative feelings. They can tell when a problem is more than they can handle on their own. And they also know when to seek help from family, friends, or professionals like their doctor. There are many ways to improve or maintain good emotional health. I could um, present a, a five-day seminar on ways to maintain good um, emotional health. But for today, we're going to discuss four specific strategies that you can use to improve or maintain your emotional health. We're going to talk about developing a positive mindset, managing your stress, being mindful, and strengthening your social connections. And for each of these strategies, I'll introduce one short research-based activity that you can practice to help manage your own stressors. People who are emotionally well have fewer negative emotions and are able to bounce back from difficulties faster. We talked about this. As we mentioned earlier, this quality is called resilience. Another sign of emotional wellness is being able to hold on to positive emotions longer and appreciate the good times that we have. To develop a more positive mindset, remember your good deeds. Give yourself credit for the good things that you do each day. Forgive yourself. Everybody makes mistakes. Learn from what went wrong, but don't dwell on it. Spend more time with family and friends. Surround yourself with positive people. I think we all know that one or two negative people that, you know, it's just difficult to even be around because they're so negative. So make sure you have some of those positive people in your life to balance that. Develop healthy physical habits. We always talk about this. Eat well, get your physical activity, um, get regular sleep. That all plays into your, even though that's physical health, it all plays into your emotional and mental wellness. Find purpose and meaning. Figure out what's important in life and focus on that. This could be your work, your family, volunteering, caregiving, or something else. Spend your time doing what feels meaningful to you. All right, now we're going to do a little practice to help us create that positive mindset. We all tend to ruminate on things that have gone wrong in our lives, right? A mistake we made, an argument with a spouse or a friend. We might even think about them so often that our life seems filled with these mishaps and disappointments. Looking on the bright side, even when things go wrong, is a key component to optimism. Which research links to lower states of depression, a better ability to cope with stress, and more satisfying relationships, among other benefits. So now I'm gonna walk you through a practice we call finding the silver linings. To start, I want you, you probably don't have pen and paper with you, but we would um, encourage you to do this practice with a, a pen and paper so you could write things down. But I'm just gonna ask you to think of, you know, three to five small things that make, uh, that make you feel like your life is enjoyable. Maybe it's a hot cup of coffee. Maybe it's something funny your grandchild said to you yesterday. What are some three things that make life enjoyable for you? Again, these things can be as general as being in good health, or as specific as drinking that cup of uh, coffee in the morning. The purpose of this first step is to help you shift into a positive state of mind about your life in general. And we know from research that the more you think about positive things that you happen and remember past positive things, um, the uh, generally better mood you're in. So next, I want you to think about the most recent time when something didn't go your way or when you felt frustrated, irritated, or upset. And again, I'd ask you to write this um, down, but um, because I you know, didn't prepare you for it, I'd just like you to think um, of a statement and that briefly describes the situation. Then, 
I want you to think of three things that can help you see the bright side of the situation. Again, we would expect you to have an, uh, a piece of paper, a notepad to write this down. So list those three things that can help you see the bright side of the situation. Another term for this is called recasting. So what could possibly be positive about this stressful, frustrating situation? An example, uh, for you, perhaps you expected, um, let me start over. Perhaps an unexpected rain shower forced you to postpone mowing your lawn. And now your schedule will be off for the rest of the day. What are three ways to look on the bright side of that situation? It might be now you have some time to get some of your other work done or maybe to go fishing. Another thing, you might be fortunate to have a spouse or partner that can mow that lawn later in the day while you do your other chores. Or you might have some free time now to spend with someone you care about. When I started this practice, I'll tell you, it was kind of hard to come up with those three positive um, silver linings for me. But with practice, it does become um, much easier. So regularly completing this um, exercise can help you get in the habit of recognizing the positive aspects of your life and seeing the upside to some of the challenging situations rather than fixating on the downside. The next strategy, manage your stress. Everyone feels stress from time to time. Stress can give you a rush of energy when it's needed most, and that's a good thing. But if stress lasts a long time, a condition known as chronic stress, those high alert changes become harmful rather than helpful. They actually, um, you know, biologically affect your body. The hormones that are released that caused by that stress can cause harmful effects. So learning healthy ways to cope with stress can also boost your resilience. In addition to getting enough sleep, exercise, and good nutrition, set priorities. Decide what must get done and what can wait. Say no to new tasks if they're putting you into overload or if you really don't want to do them but you feel like you're obligated. Think positive. We just talked about that. Notice what you've accomplished at the end of the day rather than what you didn't get done. You can try some relaxation methods. Also, strive for balance. What's healthy balance for you? What's the balance between work and play, activity and rest? Make sure to make time for those things you enjoy. Lastly, seek help. Talk to a mental health professional if you feel that you're not able to cope or have suicidal thoughts or use drugs or um, alcohol to cope with that chronic stress. Here's another um, practice that you can do. Um, simplifying your life. That seems simple. It's not. You, again, have to be intentional about it. Make it a part of your plan. We often feel that there's not enough time to do what we need to do because we're trying to do too much. One way to manage this time stress is to simplify your life. To simplify is to make something less complicated and therefore easier to do. Simplifying is to consciously choose to give up certain things in your life. So ask yourself these three questions. Am I doing what I value? Well, you have to take a moment to think about what your values are to answer that question. Is this activity or thing worth my time, energy, or resources? And lastly, does this bring me joy or happiness? Now, you don't have to say yes to all of those, um, you know, to be something that you're going to do or not do. But ask those questions to help you um, think about what you want to say yes and no to. Prioritize these activities are important and eliminate those that aren't. These small time savings can add up big time. It might be, take a time, might be time to take an honest look at your life and assess what you really don't need to spend your time doing. I'm going to give you a couple examples to think about how this might play out. 
when my um, three adult children were teenagers, one of our sons played basketball, among other sports. And in the winter time, um, we would drive an hour, two hour to these basketball games. And it, after a while, it just seemed painful. And my husband and I talked about it and we finally approached our son and we said, would you mind if we didn't go to all of your away games? And thinking that he was going to be disappointed, he says, well, I don't care. He says, I thought you were kind of goofy for going to him anyway. And we're like, why? We, I mean, we were making ourselves go just because we felt, you know, we needed to. Another thing, um, my husband um, is a big gardener and we used to have these big gardens and I used to can and put food away. And finally, when our children were gone, I took a step back and thought, why am I still doing this? Um, I'm busy. And um, so that was one thing I stepped back from to simplify my life. But um, maybe um, right now, I'd like you to think about, take just a moment to think about what's one thing you could do to simplify your life right now? Or what's one thing you could say no to in order to keep your life more simple? Would anybody like to chime in? I cannot see the chat. So Amanda, if you can see the chat and anybody would offer anything up, I'd ask you to, um, to read that. Would anybody like to open their mic and just volunteer something that you might do to simplify your life or that you have done? Maybe something will come in later. All right, let's move on to our third concept, being mindful. The concept of mindfulness is really about being aware of what's happening in the present. You've heard this before probably. What's going on in the present moment? Um, it's all the things going on inside your mind at the present moment or all the things happening around you. It means not living life on autopilot. What do I mean by autopilot? It's kind of like just doing things um, rotely over and over again. I think about my commute when I was actually driving to work and there were a couple of large hills and at any given day, I wasn't sure if I was, um, you know, on the Plum City side or the Ellsworth side of my drive because those hills look so similar and I was so on autopilot that I wasn't even thinking. It's a way to calm our minds so that we can be more relaxed, refreshed, and attentive. It's a way of building our inner strength and being a little bit more balanced in our life. What are some ways to be more mindful? Well, earlier when I asked you to take a couple deep breaths, it can be that simple. Some taping, some deep breaths in and out and focusing on just the moment and not ruminating on the past or the future. Enjoy a stroll. As you walk, notice your breath, notice nature around you. We also know from research that um, being in nature helps reduce our stress. Be aware of your emotions and your reactions. Notice what it is in your life that makes you sad, frustrated, or angry. Try to address or change those things. Oftentimes we are so busy that we don't even pay attention to what we're really feeling. Um, what does anger feel like? What does it look like in your body? Pay attention to those things and express those feelings in appropriate ways. Let people close to you know when something is bothering you. Keeping those feelings of sadness or anger inside just adds to the stress. It can cause problems in your re relationship, at work or at school, wherever you are. Um, so don't be afraid. We all haven't, we haven't really sometimes been raised or been encouraged to discuss our feelings. And part of that is because um, our parents or adults in our lives weren't comfortable with our negative feelings. So they didn't ask us, but we need to be able to express those feelings to um, reduce the stress in our life. Lastly, think before you act. Give yourself some time to think and be calm before you say or do something you might regret. Sometimes we make decisions just based on our 
anger or frustration. And if we think about it for half a day, we're like, oh, yeah, I probably wouldn't have chosen that um, path if I had taken some time to think about it. So here's a strategy or another skill or practice that we can use. It's called a self-compassion break. Difficult situations become even harder when we beat ourselves up over them, interpreting them as a sign that we're not capable or worthy. In fact, we often judge ourselves more harshly than we judge others, especially when we make a mistake or feel stressed out. It makes us feel isolated, unhappy, and even more stressed. Research suggests that people who treat themselves with compassion rather than criticism in difficult times experience greater physical and mental health. So rather than harsh criticism, treat yourself with compassion and understanding. I'm gonna walk you again through a very short exercise that contains three main components of self-compassion. Mindfulness, a feeling of common humanity, and self-kindness. How are we kind to ourselves? So again, I'd like you to think of a situation in your life that is difficult and causing you stress. I'll give you a few moments to think about a situation in your life that's causing you stress. Now call that situation to mind and see if you can actually feel the stress and emotional discomfort in your body. Sometimes your heart begins to race or you breathe a bit more shallow and you can just feel the stress in your body. Now say to yourself, this is a moment of suffering. Say it out loud, say it to yourself. This is a moment of suffering. This acknowledgement is a form of mindfulness of simply noticing what's going on for you emotionally in the present moment without judging it as good or bad. You could also say to yourself, this hurts or this is stress. Whatever statement feels most natural to you, just acknowledging that this is challenging, this is a moment of suffering. Next, I'd like you to say to yourself, um, suffering is a part of life. Suffering is a part of life. This is the recognition of common humanity with others, that all people suffer, all people have trying experiences, and these experiences give you something in common with the rest of humanity, rather than mark you as, as, as abnormal or deficient in some ways. Other people go through this as well. Other options or statements that might fit you better are, I'm not alone, or we all struggle in our lives. So you've taken that moment to be mindful about the suffering, you're acknowledging that this is um, hum all humanity experiences this. Now, I'd like you to take your hands and put them over your heart. Feel the warmth of your hands and the gentle touch on your chest and say out louder to yourself, may I be kind to myself. May I be kind to myself. This is a way to express self-kindness. You can also consider saying something like, may I give myself the compassion that I need, or may I learn to accept myself the way that I am. May I be strong, may I be patient. Whatever words um, feel right for you at that moment. If you practice it, this um, self-compassion break, in moments of relatively calm where you aren't really high stressed, it might actually become easier for you to experience that self-compassion when you need it the most. The fourth strategy we're gonna talk about, building those social connections and strengthening them. Social connections help protect health and lengthen life. Scientists are finding that our links to others have powerful effects on our health both emotionally and physically. 
whether with romantic partners, families, friends, neighbors, or others, social connections can influence our biology and well-being. So how can we build those healthy support systems? <clears throat> build strong relationships with your kids and other family members. If you're a family caregiver, ask for help from others. We often find ourselves in that situation where we're caring for others. We can't do it alone. Reach out. Join a group focused on a favorite hobby, painting, photography, hunting, bowling, whatever it is. Find some people that have something in common with you. Take a class to learn something new. You're almost always gonna meet other people there <clears throat> that have similar um, interests. Volunteer for things you care about in your community. Make a lunch date, join a group, or say hi to a stranger. We all need these positive connections with other people. There's new research <clears throat> that's coming out recently about the effects of social isolation on people and that it's more um, harmful to us than um, you know, lifelong um, chronic addictions to alcohol, smoking, those kinds of things. So it does affect our health, just like um, those other um, things that aren't necessarily good for us. The activity here is I'm gonna ask you, well, first of all, in our everyday lives, we routinely spend um, time around strangers, but we don't always strike up conversations with them. The exercise um, that we're gonna do invites you to make a connection rather than remaining in solitude whether in a waiting room or in a line at the grocery store, have a conversation with a new person today. Try to make a connection, find out something interesting about them and share something about you. The longer the conversation, the better. Your goal is to try to get to know the person. Although people are probably more, more willing to talk than you expect, it's important to be sensitive if you sense that they really don't wanna have a conversation with you. If they do seem interested, um, some good tips about conversation, maybe to ask questions related to your immediate context. If you're in the grocery store, ask them about an, um, an item in their cart and what, what they're going to make with it. Um, maybe if it's just in a general situation, you can ask them what they do for fun or, you know, any other general questions that might come to mind. Uh, leverage your knowledge of current events or the, uh, or the news. You might comment on their colorful face mask and ask them where they got it or if they made it. Explore their interests, particularly if you seem to be having some things in common. Like uh, for example, I see you drive a Subaru too. Social connection is crucial to our happiness and yet we spend many moments of the day in polite solitude. This practice transforms moments that might otherwise feel slightly negative into an opportunity to smile, share something about yourself, and if nothing else, brighten somebody else's day. I remember when my, my kids were young again, I often was waiting in a line, would talk to somebody in front of me or behind me. And, and um, my, I, for some reason, my, my kids would just kind of like look away. They're like, oh no, there she goes again. But um, I feel like I taught them something important that you do need to interact. This, you know, um, this, if nothing else, again, is helping brighten someone else's day. Lastly, sometimes the emotional toll of our stress becomes so overwhelming that we find ourselves or someone we care about in situations of severe distress and hopelessness. But I wanna remind you, there's always someone to reach out to. Don't wait, make that first step, whether it's for you or someone you love. On this slide, I note the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline um, Wisconsin Department Ag Trade and Consumer Protection Farm Center. Um, SAMHSA, I mentioned this before, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. And the Harvest of Hope is also um, an organization in Wisconsin that provides some um, financial assistance to farms in crisis. Um, they do have an application and you could probably Google it on the web to find out more information or um, you could maybe um, connect with Amanda um, later and I can get those resources to her. But just know um, there, there's someone there that you have to, you know, hopefully make that first move or be that person to help someone else. All right, that was a lot of information in 40 minutes. 
So what I'm going to do right now is stop sharing my screen. And then just ask if anyone has any questions or just start a sh short discussion. Um, maybe let's just start with um, that idea of emotional stress. Are folks feeling like this is something you're going through? This is Amanda. I guess I can say that uh, through this time with my job, it's definitely been a big change. I used to go to the office every day and now I work from home. Um, so that is kind of stressful getting into that routine um, and trying to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. This pandemic has really um, taken its toll on a lot of folks when we talk about um, when we talk about the isolation, I mean, that's really exasperated that whole social isolation situation and just the fear of the unknown and um, major changes in our routine all add into that emotional stress. Um, yeah, uh, someone noted that, that I miss an important resource and that's the church and your pastor. Absolutely. And when I talked about um, stress, we talked about it in terms of mind, body, and, and um, spirit. And um, many people think that spirit is, means religion, but it doesn't. But religion does fit into that spirituality piece. And that's part of that balance. And many of us um, receive um, that help, that assistance, that support through our local church and, and our, our pastors and, and people that um, provide support. So thanks for that reminder. Does anybody else want to just comment on what other resources that you might, that you do use to help with your emotional um, stress in particular? Lori, I, I, I'll just kind of comment that on with the church and your pastor. I have actually been working with a few producers who have not been able to have those face-to-face um, -face meetings at all, or those connections and the groups that they did have by going to, to church. And so I think different communities are probably a little bit different, but they're missing that. And so it's kind of hard on them. Right. And when you go to that balance, in that balance, if that was a major part of your um, spiritual support or, right. you know, emotional support, and now you can't do that. And I would say that's true for many of our um, congregations or, um, you know, um, churches who have either gone to a virtual, um, you know, uh, masses and things. Um, or in my case, you have to sign up to go and then you're still sitting far apart and there's not a lot of interaction. So, um, yeah, just acknowledge that that is. So then what do you do? I mean, if you know that's missing and you need that, what are some other things? Creatively thinking, what could fill that? Maybe it's a more, a smaller group. Maybe it's a you know, a group of small friends from your church that could gather social distance using the social distancing um, to get together. Well, that's what I've suggested is kind of like trying to do something like that and kind of start a more personal Zoom or something like mm -hmm. that. I don't know if they follow through on that because, of course, a lot of them don't have that kind of technology at home either. Yeah. But but also maybe um, conference calls, like one woman actually said that she had the capability of doing that at home. She had brought her work home, her work phone home. Oh. Yeah. So she could set those up, but I don't know, not everybody has that either. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that we still have telephones we can use. I mean, um, 
you mentioned the pastor. We could still call our pastor if we're in a time of need. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Calls for some creativity for sure. What did you think about the activities? Do any of those seem like something that you could use every day in your life? Uh, I will also send Amanda, uh, I have a slide of the resources. I'll send that slide to her so that she could um, add it to the website if she posts this recording. Um, and those activities um, are listed under the, uh, the resources. So there, and there's a lot more of them as well if you wanna go in and, and check them out. So they'll be there for you. Great, thank you, Lori. And yeah, I will say that um, at Agribility, we do have the information on Harvest of Hope. So if anyone is looking for that as well, we can, uh, if you reach out to me, I can get that information for you um, either sent you know, via email or snail mail. Perfect. Um, and before we do end today, um, we have a quick poll that we wanted to, um, just two questions for everyone. So um, if possible, um, if you're seeing the poll, if you could fill that out, um, that would be great. And I appreciate all of you taking the time today um, to visit with us. Lori, did you have anything else? Um, just a reminder that um, we have uh, a number of educators like myself in many of our um, counties. So if you do have some questions, you might um, contact your local extension um, office for additional information or support. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for joining us today.